Steel is one of the most ubiquitous materials in the built environment. It's incredibly versatile, used for everything from reinforcement in concrete to wind turbine towers. But overall, do you think it's helping or harming the energy transition? On the one hand, it's a source of a large proportion of the world's emissions. And on the other hand, it's a critical material for a lot of the technologies we're going to need to transition away from fossil fuels. It's a bit of a trade-off currently, but emerging technologies are available to eliminate emissions from steel, which would make it more of a clear climate helper. And in this video, we're going to talk about progress towards one of those, a hydrogen-based fossil-free steel-making technology. I'm Rosie Barnes. Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. Steel contributes about 7% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, and it's one of those hard to decarbonize sectors. Or I should say hard -er to decarbonize, because there are known ways to eliminate emissions from steel making, but it's just not as easy as simply swapping the electricity source from fossil fuel to renewable. Carbon dioxide emissions come from several parts of the steelmaking process. In traditional steelmaking, iron ore is reduced by adding coke to the ore inside a blast furnace. Carbon atoms from the coke join with oxygen from the ore, forming CO2 and iron. Around 90% of CO2 emissions from a typical steel plant comes from this process alone. And on average, there are a little under two tons of CO2 emitted for every ton of steel produced. There is another process to get from iron ore to iron, direct reduced iron, DRI. In that, oxygen is removed from the ore by reacting it with carbon or another reducing gas, traditionally produced from natural gas or coal, without melting it. there are a few technology options available to reduce emissions from steel making. Steel can be recycled in an electric arc furnace, which is an existing technology. It's been around for a couple hundred years, but the amount that can be produced this way, it's limited based on the amount of available scrap. Currently around 30% of steel is made this way, and it's not likely to reach above that until after 2050, because we're using a lot more steel each year than the amount that's scrapped. To get more steel than the amount available to recycle, you need to turn iron ore into iron. Low emissions methods to do that include electric chemical processes, biomass, and hydrogen. I talked about electrochemical steel production in previous videos. Those technologies are still developing and best case will be ready to make a significant volume of steel sometime in the 2030s, by which time we need to have already reduced emissions significantly. So that can't be the sole solution. That leaves biomass and hydrogen as the more mature technologies available to reduce emissions in the near future. Biomass can be more or less directly substituted for coke in the traditional steelmaking process. It's already being used on a small scale, but it would be hard to increase the amount of steel produced this way as massively increasing biomass brings with it a whole suite of other problems. So that leaves hydrogen as the best option to be quickly scaled. And that's the aim of Nordic steelmaker SSAB, who are the sponsor of this video. SSAB have partnered with iron ore producer LKAB and energy company Vattenfall to form the Hybrid Initiative. Hybrid aims to offer fossil-free steel at an industrial scale from 2026. This is part of the way that SSAB intends to achieve their goal to largely eliminate their own carbon dioxide emissions by around 2030. Over the past six years, a project has been developing their hydrogen direct reduction technology, and they already delivered the world's first fossil-free steel to their customer Volvo back in August 2021. The way that hydrogen steel making works is quite similar to the traditional fossil fuel processes I described earlier. It still uses a reducing agent to remove the oxygen from the iron ore, but instead of carbon reacting with oxygen and producing carbon dioxide, we use hydrogen, which produces water vapor as a byproduct. And because the byproduct of this reaction is just water, SSAB decided to bottle it. They're calling it pure waste, and CTO Martin Pye even went so far as to drink some during COP27. One of the advantages of this process is that the change is not that big compared to traditional steel making. When you replace carbon with hydrogen, whether in a blast furnace or by direct reduction, the processes are similar to traditional ones, and in some cases it will be possible to reuse and retool existing equipment. This is significant because a larger portion of the world's steel plants have decades left in their expected lifetimes. New coal-based steel projects started in 2021 alone are worth around $100 billion. So if they can't be repurposed for a fossil-free alternative, then that will either be stranded assets or locked in CO2 emissions past 2050. The hybrid project is going to include fossil-free pellet production before the direct reduction and then smelting in a renewable energy-powered electric arc furnace after to end up with steel. In addition, trials are already underway in a rock cavern hydrogen storage facility in Lulio. The storage means that they'll have a more reliable supply of hydrogen from renewable electricity since they can make it when it's windy and take it from storage when it's not. 
The hybrid initiative aims to be able to supply commercial volumes of fossil-free steel in 2026. So that's 10 years after the project started, and it should be in time for steel companies and manufacturers who use steel to get some of the emissions reductions that they've committed to by 2030. But how significant is this? Can it make a dent in overall emissions? You might be surprised, actually. Um, It will vary from country to country, depending on how big their steel industry is. But 17% of emissions from China, the world's largest steel producer, for example, come from steel. And SSAB these plans in Sweden and Finland aim to reduce those countries' total emissions by 10% and 7% respectively. Thanks to SSAB for sponsoring this video. They have established an online knowledge sharing platform on fossil-free steel and the hybrid technology. Click on the link in my description to discover more about SSAB's journey to eliminate CO2 from the steel industry by 2030. I find this progress in steel making technology very exciting, but I'm aware that not everyone gets so excited about steel. Changing to an emissions free manufacturing process won't really change the look or the feel or the structural properties, so it's not as visible as replacing, say, coal power plants with wind and solar, and probably not as exciting as replacing petrol cars with electric. But the climate impact of steel at 7% of global greenhouse gas emissions is not that different to passenger cars at about 9%. So it's definitely worth the effort to develop the technology to decarbonize it. We use nearly 2 billion tons of steel per year globally. Because it's so prevalent, as countries grow and develop, steel use keeps increasing too. Under a business as usual scenario, steel demand and its associated emissions are expected to increase by about 30% by 2050. As well as all the traditional uses of steel, the next 30 years will also see an increase in steel use for energy transition technologies like renewable energy and electric vehicles. Over 80% of a wind turbine's mass is from steel or iron in the tower, drivetrain, hub, and foundation. Each megawatt of wind power uses over 100 tons of steel, and according to IRENA, we need to add about 6 million megawatts of wind turbines by 2050. Solar farms use around 40 tons of steel per megawatt, mostly for their supporting structures, and we're going to need to add 8 million megawatts of solar photovoltaic by 2050. The extra steel needed for just those two renewable energy technologies are forecast by BP to increase global steel demand by 2% in 2030 and by 4% in 2050. Other forms of renewable energy use steel too, for turbines for hydro and tidal power, um, to reinforce concrete in hydroelectric dams, agricultural equipment used for biomass, to make wave energy converters, etc. And in case you think that the solution is to keep using fossil fuels instead, well, coal and gas power plants also use a lot of steel and their fuel is mined using equipment made of steel and transported in ships made of steel. It's pretty hard to get away from large amounts of steel usage if we want to continue to use energy. Are new steel making processes the smartest way to reduce all the emissions from steel? Just finding a new way to make essentially the same old steel that we've been using for centuries? Can't we do better, smarter, develop a new material to use instead? The answer to that is yes, that's happening too. Forward projections assume major reductions in steel demand due to more efficient use of the material. These come from things like improving manufacturing yields, um, extending building lifetimes, and light weighting vehicles. There are also options to replace steel with alternative materials. These include using polyethylene to reinforce concrete instead of standard rebar, making wooden skyscrapers, making wooden wind turbine towers, or replacing some of the steel in cars with carbon fiber. But none of these substitutions are an easy win. It's hard to match steel's combination of high strength, durability, recyclability, and low cost. And it's such a commonly used material that availability would surely prevent large chunks of steel demand being replaced with, say, sustainable timber. So we're going to be using a whole lot of steel for the next few decades at least, and we need to decarbonize it ASAP. I happen to believe that fossil-free steel manufacturing has other upsides too, in particular in places where great renewable energy resources are near iron ore deposits. It can be a way to take advantage of the sun and wind without having to transport electricity or hydrogen a long way. When you see projections of really cheap hydrogen in the future, that amount doesn't include the cost to transport from where it's made to a place where it can be used. When you factor in transport, that could increase the cost by somewhere in the range of two to 10 times depending on how far it's got to go. That's because hydrogen is very tricky to transport. The molecules are tiny and H2 molecule is around one eighth the size of a methane molecule. So it leaks through small gaps and causes a range of other issues, including embrittlement and fire or explosion risk. Currently, the vast majority of the world's hydrogen is made right where it's used. And this is because it's so hard to transport. I think it will be much cheaper and easier to manufacture hydrogen and steel where renewable resources are good and then ship the steel rather than trying to ship the 
hydrogen itself. I assume that's why the hybrid project is starting in northern Sweden. I used to travel there for work a lot to Europe's largest onshore wind farm. There is so much wind energy and so few people living there to use it. On some of my visits, I got to talk to people who were setting up energy intensive manufacturing there to take advantage of the cheap renewable energy. And now hybrid also plans to take advantage of the nearby iron ore deposits. Another place that has that same combo of great renewable resources and iron ore deposits and is even further from where people live is Western Australia. There are a lot of projects planned to take advantage of great wind and solar potential in the Australian desert, but they all have the challenge of needing to transport electricity or hydrogen long distances. I think this would be another way and perhaps an easier way to kind of export sunshine from the Australian desert. I don't know if anyone is currently planning a project like that, but I'm sure it's only a matter of time. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.